1922 in England. Prince Albert, nicknamed Bertie, has proposed to the woman of his dreams, Elizabeth Bowes Lyon. But she's rejected him twice. And it seems the shy royal is too timid to fight for his beloved any further. Dear Bertie is broken hearted. But unbeknownst to the lovelorn royal, he has a secret cupid, society hostess and family friend, Margaret Greville. She's 57 years old. She's very wealthy. She's childless. But Mrs. Greville adores Bertie. He is a son she never had. Mrs. Greville was an inveterate romantic. She loved matchmaking. Eager to galvanize Bertie into action, it seems Mrs. Greville hatches a clever plan. Arranged royal marriages are common. So she reasons that if the prince believes Elizabeth is being promised to another, he will panic and propose one last time. Bertie's own mother had previously been engaged to Bertie's father's brother. In other words, in royal circles, if a bride is good enough for one prince, she's good enough for another. So Mrs. Greville reportedly turns to the local press, which she has used in the past to influence others. Then it is believed she plants a false newspaper story that implies Elizabeth is engaged to none other than Bertie's brother, Edward. Now, we don't know this for certain, but this particular story has Mrs. Greville's fingerprints all over it. Incredibly, the article seems to have a tremendous effect. Young Bertie was horrified. This was an appalling prospect as far as he was concerned. He was determined to resolve this, and he wanted to ask her one more time to marry him. So he boldly proposes to Elizabeth again. He asks her. And this time, she says yes. They're thrilled. Mrs. Greville was absolutely thrilled. The two marry three months later in Westminster Abbey. Mrs. Greville offered them the use of her house, Pauls and Lacey, for a honeymoon, which they enjoyed enormously. And Mrs. Greville decided that Bertie should be the recipient of the estate when she died. The couple's marriage proves to be a happy and successful one. But neither could have imagined what would happen next. In 1936, Prince Edward abdicates the throne to marry an American divorcee. So Bertie and Elizabeth are crowned king and queen. They went on to be an exceptionally good royal couple. They were wonderful for the British during the Second World War. They were much loved in this country and greatly respected. Mrs. Greville had a hand in possibly one of the most successful marriages for British history. Today, Polston Lacey serves as a glamorous reminder of a mischievous nudge that blossomed into one of the most important nuptials of all time. plot carried out by America's first public enemy number one leads back to this secluded estate called the gateway to the Rocky Mountains Golden Colorado was once a pivotal supply center for prospectors perched atop a cliff overlooking this mile-high town is the imposing Betcher Mansion when you walk up to the Betcher Mansion, you really get the sense of, of a castle. The sprawling abode includes a large stone carriage house, timber detailing, and decorative lanterns. It is a combination of cliff gables and overhanging eaves. Pretty much everywhere you look, there are windows opening up on expansive views. The lavish features inside the home are even more awe-inspiring. The interior of the Betcher Mansion is magnificent. The stone walls, a cathedral ceiling, an eagle neck fireplace, they gave it the sense of an English country manor. The family who built this home was famed for their riches and success. But this notoriety came with a price that left one of them pleading for his life. His family had it all until they were struck by a devastating assault. Betcher is a hard-working 31-year-old from a well-renowned family of industrialists. The Betchers owned a number of mansions in the Denver area, including the Betcher Mansion, 
they were very successful and very wealthy. On the night of February 12th, Charles and his beautiful wife, Anna Lou, are returning home after a party. It is a typical end to a fun evening for the social couple. But all of a sudden, from the darkness, two menacing figures appear. The kidnappers were demanding $60,000, but they threatened to kill Charles. Anna Lou alerts her father-in-law, Claude, who immediately calls the police. But when the authorities question Anna Lou about the incident, she is unable to shed any light on who the assailant might have been. So the police adopt a different strategy. They immediately threw up a roadblock around the city of Denver to try and catch the kidnappers. Then they scour the streets for any trace of the well-known hostage. But their efforts come up short. As they stretched into weeks, Charles' situation seemed more desperate. They had no idea if Charlie was alive or dead. With no other option, the Betchers resolved to give in to the kidnappers' demands. So they broadcast a radio message announcing they will pay the ransom. It wasn't long before the Betcher family received letters from the kidnappers instructing them on when and where to make the payoff. Following orders, the Betchers send the money with a friend to a specified bridge. Then, all Claude and Anna Lou can do is hope that the culprits hold up their end of the deal. There was absolutely no guarantee that Charles would ever come back through the door safe and sound. But on the 17th day of the crisis, the phone rings. It was Charles calling from a store at Denver. He was back alive and well. Soon after, Charles and Anna Lou are finally reunited. But one last question continues to haunt the family. Both the Batchers and the police wanted to know, who were the kidnappers? While the criminals are still at large, the couple fear they won't truly be safe. Desperate to bring the criminals to justice, police turn to the public for assistance. Before long, they receive a tantalizing clue. A man named Charles Pierce began bragging in the local saloon that he knew how the kidnapping had taken place. He claimed that he had actually typed up the ransom notes. Authorities interrogate this accomplice and eventually learn that the leader of the kidnappers was a man named Burl Sankey. He was well known in Denver as a bootlegger to the richest families. He was also a heavy gambler who took on big debts. Then, working with the newly formed FBI, police launch a nationwide manhunt. The police had every reason to believe that Sankey was armed and dangerous. As a result, the FBI created what became known as the Public Enemies List, and Bernd Sankey was declared America's first public enemy number one. Finally, after a year of searching, the posters and publicity pay off. The Bureau receives a tip from a woman in Illinois, America's most wanted frequent a barbershop in Chicago. This was a major break in the case. If he's sitting with his eyes closed, getting a shave, they have the best chance to actually take him without resistance. On January 31st, 1934, officers watch as Sankey enters the barbershop. Then, once he is comfortably seated in his chair, they stealthily enter the building. America breathed a sigh of relief that Sankey was off the streets. After the kidnapping, the Betchers spent time recuperating at their home in the mountains. It was described once as a refuge for family. Today, the Betcher Mansion stands as a testament to the epic manhunt that brought the FBI's first public enemy number one to justice. A high-stakes gambler puts it all on the line at this opulent manor. Located on the outskirts of Paris, Fontainebleau is a small town famous for the cheese that shares its name. But it is also home to one of the most <coughs> impressive palaces on the planet, the Chateau de Fontainebleau. The Chateau de Fontainebleau is one of the most magnificent buildings I've seen. Originally built as a hunting lodge in the 12th century, it was later expanded into this sprawling royal estate. The palace is so big that there's five totally separate courtyards and 50,000 acres of forest around it. It's fabulous. The enormous interior has 1,500 rooms, 
representing a vast array of regal tastes. One of the best rooms is the Stag Gallery, but the antlers are actually real. Another terrific space is Diane's Gallery. There's beautiful curved ceilings, and Napoleon's throne room shows his wealth. There's gold everywhere. This manor amounts to an overpowering display of riches. But one woman was drained of her fortune inside these very walls. This is one of the most fascinating tales of a truly enormous gambling debt. Forty-year-old Emily du Chablais is a wealthy aristocrat who is also highly intelligent. Emily du Chablais was exceptional. She was a brilliant scientist. And she had a terrific mathematical mind. The witty Emily adds a welcome sparkle to the French court, along with her lover, Voltaire. Voltaire was a charming man. He was already known as the greatest writer in all of France. He was a vain man with a great deal to be vain about. One day in October, the couple travels to the Chateau de Fontainebleau for a gathering of the Queen's favorite courtiers. And the people who were invited were the top and wealthiest aristocrats in the whole kingdom. Shortly after they arrive, the fun begins as the group sits down to one of Emily's favorite activities, cards. Emily was a much better gambler than most other people because she could count cards and she could calculate probabilities far better than anybody else. So the brilliant Emily is eager to show off her skills and make some quick cash. <laughs> 